Good morning. Good morning again. Uh, I'd like to call to order uh, this morning's buffet of committee meetings for the uh, Columbia County Commission, starting with the audit committee uh, for December 10th, 2019, beginning on time at 8.30. Would uh, all please bow your heads for an invocation before we begin today's proceedings. Dear Heavenly Father and Creator of all things, we come before you this season of festivities and holiday spirit with joy in our hearts and, and hope that you look over each one of us as we go about our business in the, the busy times of the holidays and closing out the year for our, our personal lives and our, our business lives, business of the people of Columbia County. We ask that you be with everyone up here today as we go about the people's business and that everything we say and do be good and just in your sight. We thank you for your, your many servants who also serve the people of our county, great staff and employees of this county that go about their business taking care of our citizens each and every day. Thank you for these many blessings and for allowing us to live in this great nation and this great community. Amen. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let the record show that we have the entire commission on the dais, including uh, all of the, thereby forming a quorum, I guess. <coughs> uh, may I have approval of the previous meeting of audit, September 10th, 2019's minutes? So moved. Second. Uh, any adjustments to the agenda we have before us this morning? Not audit? my knowledge, Mr. Chairman. You guys good? All right. So we move straight into the presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, the approval is done. The debate agenda, new business, and draft reports. Mr. Schneider. Thank you, and good morning to uh, everyone. Morning. Uh, in, in light of the um, busy schedule today, we're going to try to move through this pretty quickly. I have three reports to present to you today, and we're going to jump right into the recycling center. Um, if you open up the recycling center report, you'll see a summary on page three. A summary of our results, um, you're going to see that for all of our standard procedures, we had no exceptions, including observing uh, cash counts at both locations, um, selecting several uh, deposits uh, to trace through the, to the transmittal form and back to the finance department, um, selected several POs, uh, looked at purchase card transactions over several weeks, um, and looked at timesheets with no exceptions. Um, during our general inquiries and observations, we did um, note that um, there's some room for additional equipment, uh, specifically balers, um, and also there was some discussion um, that uh, due to some turnover in staff, there may be a consideration of increasing hourly wages, and so our recommendation is to consider equipment uh, needs and uh, potentially taking a look at compensation in the um, recycling center. That's our only recommendation. Questions about the recycling center? Do we not pay the recycling center what we pay the base wages our normal folks? We do. We do. <clears throat> we do. And we look at that. We look at that every year. I mean, this is this is a problem not just in that, but on. You know, we did adjust our lower our entry level wages. Right. Um, but even now, the market is so competitive. Even at that entry level wage, we're having a lot of turnover in those positions. It's not just that department. It's lots of departments. That's, that's the downside of a good economy is um, competitive uh, job market. So any other concerns about the recycling center before we move on to the sheriff's office? No. no. So uh, our second report uh, we're presenting to you today is the internal audit of the sheriff's office. Um, we um, performed several standard procedures there as well. Um, you can find a summary of those results on the third and fourth page of that report. Uh, we tested cash collections, um, selecting multiple deposits from, uh, from various months throughout the year, tracked them through their, <clears throat> their record management system, finding uh, no exceptions there. Um, I'm going to skip over the discussion of excess, ca excess cash calculations for just a moment. We'll come back to that. Um, the, uh, the bank reconciliations, we, we looked at uh, all of the, they managed uh, several 
bank accounts. And we looked at uh, two particular months for all of the bank reconciliations. And we found, um, as we documented here, uh, spotty documentation of the review of the reconciliations. We didn't find any errors in the reconciliations. Um, and we just put it together in a sort of matrix where we can show uh, that <clears throat> most, uh, well, maybe it's about 50-50 on showing the documentation of review. Again, we didn't see any errors in the uh, reconciliations, but we did document uh, that. Um, and we also, there's another bullet point here concerning the inmate trust account having a large number of outstanding checks. So these are the, um, the checks that are issued to inmates as they exit the jail, and there are 421 of those that have not been cashed by those uh, inmates. The total is only $4,000, so we did note that. We also examined those actual inmate uh, purchase accounts. We selected um, uh, an, an entire month and looked at all of the transactions during that month, found no issues um, there. Uh, the sheriff's office uses a different purchase requisition process. They don't use the exact same process as the rest of the county's departments, but we examined their um, purchase requisitions and found no issues with that. Their purchase card transactions are handled the same way as the other departments, and we found no issues there. When reviewing timesheets, we found uh, one exempt employee that took time off without filling out the leave requesting time off sheet. Very small um, sort of infraction. But <clears throat> in discussing it with management, we, um, we learned about um, a new automated time system that's coming into place in 2020 and probably will um, help to prevent <clears throat> such as that. So we also performed some general inquiries and observations of the Sheriff's Department without any issues arising. So if I can re return briefly to the um, search for excess cash, <clears throat> on page six of the report and also in the summary, you'll see a, um, a chart here, or a table I should say, um, where we um, took the reconciled balances in certain uh, accounts that are considered trust accounts. These are accounts that hold cash that doesn't belong to the Sheriff's Department, belongs to someone else. And then we looked at Sheriff's Department's records to find if there was a difference in <clears throat> the balance of those accounts and the total um, amounts that are owed to others. We expect that it should be close to zero. Um, there are four accounts that we looked at, um, and they all had a little bit more cash in them than we expected. But the inmate trust account is the one that had the most of what we might consider to be excess cash. So if you look at this column, second column from the left, you'll see that the reconciled balance in the bank account is the 94,000. The total of all of the inmate accounts in lockdown for the month that we were testing was 29,000. So that leaves $65,165 of cash held in this account that's not easily identifiable as belonging to a certain current or prior inmate. Um, we actually, on the table, did show you that last time we examined this back in 2015, that amount was 22,000, so it has increased. Uh, and our recommendation to the uh, Sheriff's Department uh, is that they uh, attempt to reconcile that difference. Um, part of their explanation is that there are uh, some previous accounting systems um, where some of that information is on paper. Um, but at any rate, our recommendation is to try and uh, reconcile that difference down. What is the process? You said there are like 400 checks outstanding. At what point do you write it off? I don't want to say write it off. I don't even well, know what you do with that money if they refuse to cash a check. If it's $4,000 and 400 checks, it can't, they have to be very small. Small checks. I mean, the rest of us have to live with timelines on a check that's issued to us. Why should the chair be burdened with carrying that? I agree with that perspective, and I'm going to defer to counsel on uh, the proper way to uh, deal with that. We call this unclaimed property. Um, the 
after taking a moment, to, or more than a moment, taking some time to try and reconcile these differences back and find to whom all of these various amounts are, are owed, um, then also perhaps making a second attempt to contact the people who have these outstanding checks. Uh, at some point, I believe that um, dollars may need to be remitted to the state as unclaimed property or something like that. But I'm, I'm going to defer to council on the proper um, way to deal with that. Scott, what would you recommend on the 65000 <clears throat> Just exactly what we're saying, that we go through that and we look and see, you know, what we can – making a second attempt to notify these people is not going to be any good. Once somebody gets out of jail, they don't want their $23 that they had in their no. account when they left jail. That's so true. us trying to find them is going to be like trying to arrest them again. Right, but that was only like <laughs> – <laughs> Four grand, right? Of sixty-five. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I think there are sometimes repeat customers. Yeah, there, there are repeat customers. I, th I think we'll just go through the process of, of trying to get it remitted as unclaimed property. That's the best way, just to clean it up. You know, the money's not being used for anything. It's being That's properly true. accounted for. It's in the proper account. It's just not being. It's, it's, it has a growing balance. It's not being dispersed. If it were being moved or something was happening to the yeah. money, I'd be concerned. But we can we can try to find a process to do that. Chris, something in. <laughs> that's probably actually good. Yeah, yeah probably maybe a car wash <laughs> gift card. Uh -huh. yeah, a green dot card. Awesome. Let's uh, <laughs> let's not uh, let's not expend too many resources. <laughs> on, let's not expend too many resources on this, counselor. To, to Mr. Galeas's point, I mean, couldn't we just issue 180 days? At that point, the check becomes null and void, and the, if it hasn't been cashed, is that not an option? Uh, before we continue, Ms. Reese, do you, does the Sheriff's Department take advantage of any resources in your your office, or are they totally autonomous other than sending you reports? We process all of their... Okay, you do... Okay, I didn't know. Payroll. Okay. Um, and just one other just kind of point about this. I think it would be um, perhaps worse if the, if the deficit were in the other direction. It's not that any money appears to be missing. Um, it's just that there's a little bit of extra money. So... Um, and let me clarify the payroll. Months run through they are right. trust accounts. That part we do. Right. Yes, that is true. There are certain accounts that are completely managed by the sheriff's department, uh, which include these. And those were what I was referring <clears throat> to. Yeah, that, that is correct. We um, when we examined all of the reconciliations. Um, Certain accounts are assigned to certain staff folks at the uh, sheriff's department, and, and again, all of our reconciliations seem to be properly uh, performed and agreed to um, the bank statements and the financial statements. Um, we looked at them. It's just more more money than inmate accounts, basically. A couple other excess funds, like this um, inactive account, this older bond trust account, which just hasn't changed in years. That's a $4,903, the fourth column. That's uh, just kind of been hanging around for a while. Any other questions about the uh, sheriff's office? I don't think so. Next. We will let him know that you thought he had spotty. <laughs> What's your tag number? I was going to say, I, I, give us your tag number. I'm going to make sure that I don't uh, uh, do any traffic. Uh, traffic. <laughs> <laughs> I see you back there with that negative communication. <laughs> All right. Um, our final report, and this will be a fast one, um, uh, we did form an internal audit of the finance department. And just to clarify, uh, with every single report that we do, including even things like the sheriff's department, at some point in time we touch base with the finance department. And so the processes that the finance department performs are tested with every uh, <coughs> every uh, department that we look at. 
Uh, and the finance department is a great uh, partner to us mm. uh, in, in completing those uh, procedures. But every three years, we have to come in and actually um, look at the transactions performed by the finance department, for which the finance department is responsible, and, um, and perform an internal audit of the finance department. So in all of our standard procedures, we had no issues. We did dedicate one paragraph, which you'll see on, the, on page three in the summary, to a discussion of journal entry testing. Uh, we tested 30 manual journal entries um, without any exceptions. But as we describe here, Munis, which is a very powerful, sometimes frustrating, accounting <laughs> software, doesn't seem to offer the, the uh, ability to approve journal entries within the software. It doesn't distinguish between system-generated journal entry, of which there are thousands, from the manual journal entry that we want to examine. Um, so, there's, so those journals, manual journal entries are being tracked and approved more manually outside of Munis. Uh, I just wish that Munis could uh, provide something easier for the um, finance department. But they're doing a great job, and we didn't see any um, gaps in internal controls surrounding journal entries and no issues with the journal entries we tested. Uh, we also um, took a look at the change fund and petty cash fund, counted that without any issues. Uh, we looked at the 15 most active accounts and reviewed the bank reconciliations and had no issues there. We saw evidence of, of review and, and no errors there. Um, we, <clears throat> we did a, a deposit test for deposits that are actually processed by the finance department, not the ones that are processed by the various departments throughout the uh, county. Uh, we looked at a total of 24 of those deposits and had no issues there. We examined the purchase cards that are actually uh, in the custody of employees of the finance department, looked at four different um, weekly uh, reports of those various cards and found no issues there. We also looked at two pay periods and the timesheets were in order as well and also reviewed merchant card statements and no issues with the finance department. So any questions about the finance department before right. I update you on our other? Mm -mm. And you have two hundred dollars in petty cash. How do you maintain control of that? <laughs> <laughs> Difficult. <laughs> Good job, Miss Race. <laughs> um, so we actually uh, recently visited with the the uh, fire services. We've completed that um, that project, and the the report just kind of barely missed the cutoff for presentation here. So we'll be presenting that to you in March. <laughs> We have an ongoing analysis that we're doing with um, a, a countywide purchase card um, program we're working on. Um, on the hotel motel tax, which we discussed last, back in September, um, we did receive some additional information. Um, and we almost were able to present that report to you, but there's one hotel that still owes us one report, um, and we're following up on that. So. Um, by the time we get that one issued to you, it'll be time to choose four more hotels, and we'll probably be doing the hotel motel tax year-round. So, um, but that's it is what it is. We're also going to be looking. Hotels required to? I mean, they are required. They're obligated to. Well, we, we've discussed this before, but there is not much of a mechanism in place to enforce that. And, and they are not required to submit reports to us, but they do have to allow us to send someone yes. in. Yes, and we go out there. Reports at their place. Okay. Send staff out to the to the location, um, and sit down in their hotels and, and and work with them there. But we also ask them to follow up and send us some reports. <laughs> um, we just had a little bit of bad luck with this batch. You know, we 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 do about four or so at a time, and we have some. Sometimes it goes really great, and sometimes we have people that are slow, but, but um, hope that'll be wrapped up in the next couple of weeks so that I'll have the uh, <coughs> hotel motel report for you um, at our next meeting. And then also, um, you know, start on some more hotels. We'll go right back into another selection of hotels. But. We, we did discuss this in the previous, in, I guess, the September meeting. September we did, did. did we, has any 
movement been been found on how we can enforce it? I, I thought we were going to look into potential. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Good to know. So something to keep in mind if if this continues to trudge along. Yes. Uh, well, uh, we we've tried to stay in touch with Leanne. Um, we just we don't want to um, contact Leanne every time one of them is late. But we've touched bases a couple times to um, to let her know. Where we are on that, and um, Sheriff's not too mad at me. I might have to call him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I think, it's, I think a judicious, a judicious uh, notification that that misdemeanor is a potential enforcement. <clears throat> <clears throat> it may be on the letter. If it's not, we can add it. Change much. Never know. All right. Any questions for? Thanks, John. Thank you, sir. You can just leave your tag number. At the yes, please. They already table have. there at the door. Very off side wait. All right, uh, moving on. The internal audit update. Miss Bonnie Cox. Excellent, Bonnie. Hi. Um, I actually get to do the external audit. Yeah, um, you just got the. the oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. That's uh, okay. All, all audits are not the same. Um, <laughs> but we are going to hit the high points on the audit results. This is for your fiscal year into June 30th, 2019. Um, that we are the, currently in our final stages of our quality review process um, in preparations to be able to issue that report this month. But our, our testing is done and we're prepared here to give you our results for that. Um, we're gonna cover our required communications and then just kind of give you an update um, on the financial audit. I'm not sure who sets the internal audit schedule, but I will say that your finance team had to deal with two sets of auditors at the same time, <laughs> dealing with us as the external auditor and then also going through the internal audit. So, um, I'm not sure who did that. <laughs> um, I did. I take. Did. <laughs> did we that did we was... skip over an internal audit report from you, Ian? Or I mean, item. No, that was it. That was okay, it. that was included in the draft reports. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. Sorry, yeah, was just, there was a couple of emails like, "What are you asking?" It's like, "Oh wait, that was yeah. the other auditor." But John was willing to wait, <laughs> but I said, "Come on, I know." Yes. All right. Um, um, so you do have um, annual reporting requirements with the state of Georgia because of the size of your county you're required to file um, a financial audit for six months within your year end say by December 31st um, is the planned deadline you're well in line to be able to meet that um, in addition to that your management has decided to go over and above the actual compliance requirements and receive what's called um, the GFOA's CAFR um, award and that's why you have uh, about twice the size of financial statement of what is the, the minimum required. Um, but every year, uh, the finance department did receive that award again last year, and um, they're very proactive in addressing the minor nitpicky comments, um, the difference between the definition of payroll and covered payroll, which are actuarial terms, and trying to get um, those things clarified. But anyway, um, your management has been able to address all those um, in the draft 2019 CAFR. All right, here's the big long list of um, required audit communications. This is where I tell you that we are ready to issue a clean, unmodified opinion on the financial statements. That second bullet there, that's not something you have every year, but we have addressed it the past two years, and that's related to uniform grant guidance. And because for the past two years you have spent over $750,000 in federal money, then you have this extra audit requirement um, that we have to issue. Um, and most of that money comes passed through the state, but at the end of the day, it is originally sourced as federal money. So um, that is a second set of compliance auditing that we do, and that also we're prepared to issue a clean opinion um, related to that. If we'd had problems getting our audit done or the financial statements done, if we'd had difficulties with your management, disagreements with your management, um, or if there were any transactions for which there's not appropriate guidance, I would bring that to your attention, but we didn't have any of those. And also, again, no material weaknesses in internal controls. That would be if we had findings, that would be reported there, but we had none of those. Um, uncorrected misstatements or misstatements in general, this speaks to adjustments. And so if I'm sitting in your shoes as the audit committee or even as the council uh, commission members, the information that's coming to you on an interim basis I didn't have any, we didn't propose any audit adjustments to that information. And so what that would tell you as members is that the information coming out of your finance department 
after it was subject to the audit procedures that we do, we didn't have any adjustments to that. So if I'm in your position, that means a lot to me that I'm not having to look at year and numbers that are way different or with a lot with any audit adjustments posted to them. Um, along with that, your management does represent to us that they were truthful in our inquiries and didn't withhold information that would have been relevant to either our audit procedures or those financial statements, um, either of those. We, we don't, and well, issue reports without um, having that management representation because we do a lot of inquiry. We corroborate that with evidence, um, but at the end of the day, we do um, expect them to be truthful with us in our inquiries. Um, we know that your management does consult with the, um, the internal audit, but by definition, that is a management function, and so they're not considered independent auditors. To our knowledge, they are not out shopping audit opinions um, against with other auditors in our opinion. All right, significant estimates. It's required in the audit standards that I communicate with you what we as the audit team have determined to be those significant estimates. Um, the reason that that's a part of the required communications is because we test those differently. They do require a lot of management judgment. Um, it's not like your invoices where you can go and tick and tie, you know, exact amounts one way or another. Um, and so it's just part of the required communications that I bring that to your attention. One of those areas is the allowance for doubtful accounts. That's um, like in your property taxes and in your water and sewer receivables and other areas like that where there's an estimate made for what's uncollectible. And so that um, requires judgment and we test that. Also, your estimated useful lives of capital assets, how long you depreciate in those trucks, how long you depreciate in those buildings, um, that equipment, how long is it actually going to be useful. So that's determined by um, an estimate. Your landfill post-closure costs, this is an area where there's a lot of technical um, input that's required on how much is the post-closure care going to cost and how long is it going to take us to be able to cover that. Um, that is a significant liability in the financial statements, and so that also is a Fair market value your investments, fortunately, uh, well, just your choice. You're not um, invested in a lot of hard-to-value investments. There's not a lot of alternative investments, which require a lot of additional audit testing there. So while fair market value of investments is an estimate, because of the nature of your investments, they're fairly simple to go out and just test to other instruments that are very similar, if not the same exact instruments there to test those. The OPEB, this is the post-employment benefits liability. This um, is, is something new last year in the statements, um, and we do rely heavily on actuarial studies for this. And so it is an estimate, but your management contracts with an outside third party need an actuary to provide you with that information to add in how many pages <laughs> the financial statement is there um, for those amounts. And we also rely on that third party. We determine it's a, a, you know, it's a specialist is qualified to be able to provide that information um, for the financial statements there. Okay. Um, no new accounting standards. So this year was a plain vanilla year in accounting world as far as accounting standards that were um, implemented. So that was a good thing. And had so many new ones over the most recent yes, years. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> nice to have a year off. <laughs> yes, and, and what's not required for me to tell you is what also is nice is there were no bond refundings, there were no new bond issues, all of which create a lot of complexities to the financial statements and burden on the disclosures and additional audit testing. So there was none of that either. Um, all right, this is just a snapshot um, to kind of clarify that additional testing that I mentioned to you about the compliance auditing. If you kind of, the government auditing, you are a governmental entity, so that's applicable every year, regardless of whether or not you spend over that 750000 in federal money. Um, but if you kind of, and, and so this, what is on my left hand side of, of the slide, that internal control over financial reporting, that's always required. And that has to do with the just general compliance with laws and regulations in your financial reporting. We had no findings there. This, the second half of this slide is really what that grant guidance, that uniform grant guidance, which is um, applicable this year. And that is, there are 14 compliance requirements out there that are over and above regular financial reporting. And again, no non-compliance, no, non no findings on internal controls over those compliance, and no um, weaknesses there to report. Um, this is a snapshot. The the DO of the of the actual programs that were tested, even when you exceed that seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, you're not required to test all of the grants. You still there's audit guidance to tell us which ones to test. So this year we did um, test the DOT funds. That was the same program that was tested last year. No findings, no matters there. This year we also got to test the transit um, program, which is funded also with federal funds there. And so um, new program that was tested this year. No findings there um, for the grant testing. Um, in a couple of years, you do have new accounting that will be significant, and that has to do with your leases. 
um, which we are in communications with um, your management um, about the impact to that. But whether you lease assets that you own or you choose to lease assets as you finance them, this um, new standard here in a couple of years is going to have a very significant impact to the financial statement. Kind of like adding a whole nother set of fixed asset schedules and depreciations, which we just are recommending people get software to do, which <laughs> they <laughs> tested a lot of them out there. It just is the simplest way to comply with the standard. That's it. No findings, no um, difficulties, plain vanilla on accounting standards. What questions might you have? Questions from Ms. Cox from the Bean Counter on the board. I want to say, good job. That <laughs> is very impressive yeah. to have two audits going on in addition to your regular everyday stuff, and they didn't find anything to ding you on. That is excellent. I agree. For the leases, um, 2021 is the current year end, but what we're recommending is you have to implement it for the whole year. So basically, you've got to be, it's over this next year that you've got to be figuring it out so that you're ready to go July 1 um, with that. They've delayed it a couple of times, and who knows what might happen there. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Questions? Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, ma'am. Appreciate it. Nice to get. Good news, as always, with finance. Um, any public comments for this committee? Seeing none, I will call for adjournment with a note that the next scheduled audit committee meeting is Tuesday, March 10th of 2020. <clears throat> Same time, 8.30 a.m. in this here auditorium. And adjourn. We will begin the MIS uh, committee in Ready. immediately. <laughs> All right, so we'll move right into management. Damn. Move on. So I will call to order the MIS committee. Uh, having already dispensed with the, hang on, there's, there's a final version as well. Hmm? Yeah, we're good. All right, so management internal services, we have a... Hang on one second, I'm trying to get my, uh, we've got final versions of the agenda and packet that have been updated. Okay. All right, so having dispensed with the invocation and Pledge of Allegiance, let the record show we have a full committee, thereby forming a quorum, approval of the November 12th minutes at your leisure. So moved. Second. So moved. Anything on the agenda, sir, I see One some. item, just to add, uh, Executive possession item is a personnel uh, contract. Okay. M1A. Which will item be item M1A as it's listed in the updated agenda. Um, no presentations. Nothing on the consent agenda. We will move directly into debate. And Mr. Johnson. Thank business. you, Mr. Chairman. For your consideration, the first item we have is uh, funding of a destination retail incentive uh, that the Development Authority has been working on for a while uh, through conversations with the Board of Commissioners uh, and management and the Development Authority. Um, we thought that it, that it may be in the best interest of the county to incentivize certain areas of the county for retail destination, one of those areas being uh, the plaza area uh, and, and areas like that. The area has been defined uh, by uh, the Development Authority. They have already passed their policy. Uh, at this time, the county is, is asking that we fund uh, this particular uh, initiative, and we're asking for $500,000 of TAVT, TAVT funds uh, to be allocated for the Development Authority to be distributed as requested according to their retail incentive policy. And this is only for the plaza right now, is that it's, correct? It's a geographic area that includes the plaza. We couldn't specifically <clears throat> make it for the plaza, but it's, the plaza makes up the majority of that area, correct? And the question uh, that was asked of me, is this a, a one-time thing? Is this going to be a recurring fund? And I, I, my answer was that I assumed it would be by budget. Yep. So they, they actually, um, their, their policy allows for a couple of different things. It allows for grants. It also allows for loans. Uh, so it's possible that this could be, uh, it could be self-perpetuating. So uh, if they got some of the money back, they could reinvest that money. Um, you know, we feel like th there are maximum incentives that can be allowed, so this will actually uh, benefit 
several retailers. Uh, so we don't want to look at it as an every year thing now. We'll look at it with the budget again. Being Coming from the special project fund, we could do it pretty much any time during the year. We just like to monitor it you know, as, as it's being distributed to see if it's something we need to continue. And we also want to look at the return on that investment too to make sure that we're getting a proper return, um, you know, be it not, not a monetary return, but certainly right. is, it, is, it, is sure. it making our, our retail area more desirable. And, but there is nothing, obviously we cannot bind a future commission, but there is nothing, There's nothing saying recurring. that we're going to use TAVT. Next year we may use something else. Right? That's so correct. May, right. That's correct. This is all a right. one-time allocation, and we're not going to move all of the money at one time. Uh, what we're going to do, if, if you decide to allocate these funds, uh, Ms. Reese will make note of that, and as they need the funds, we will allow the funds to be moved over to the Development Authority. Move to consent. Second, with a, a, a comment, the uh, I just wanted to make sure it's, it's clear that this is not just throwing five hundred thousand dollars at whoever shows up and says, "Give me money." There's a lot of ifs, ands, and buts that go with it. And there's an application fee that you have to turn in with your very specific business plan. Um, you have to be in a specific area, and it has to create at least five, I believe, five new jobs. Right. And and it's only I think a hundred thousand dollars max. That's the max per. Per um, retailer, and that retailer also has to have at least two hundred fifty thousand dollars of their own money invested. So this is not us completely funding anybody's business. They have to have a lot of skin in the game themselves, and um, you know, that there's a lot of qualifications that go along with this. It's not an easy, um, it's not an easy money grab. No, it's not. It's definitely not a gimme. It's not. It's no, it's no sort of uh, a gratuity towards these businesses is 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 an economic incentive by the development authority that has a lot of stipulations. All right. So we have a motion and a second, so moved. So next item, sir. Next item we have is resolution 1946. This is uh, supporting locally established building design standards for residential dwellings. Um, as you know, uh, we have seen legislation in the past that it's actually um, potentially threatening your ability to be able to have local design standards. Uh, so ACCG has asked all counties to pass a new resolution to support the locally established building design standards. Uh, there has been a study committee on affordable housing done uh, during the off session. That uh, affordable housing study committee uh, is is the, the cover for this particular bill. Um, I don't know that affordable housing and local design standards are hand in hand, but they believe that they are. Is that uh, it, House 302? It is. House Bill 302. 172. It, it, is, it is coming back this year. Um, we are prepared with the ACCG Policy Committee is prepared to fight it. Uh, we're just trying to get the support of all the cities and the counties. Cities are doing the same resolution. So staff will uh, recommend the passage of Resolution 1946. Move to consent. We put this on the debate agenda? At I'm sorry. Can this be yeah, on yeah, that? I certainly can. If you yes, it's so a if resolution. Like it, can go on, it can go on consent. You would it like can go to. on debate, whatever you want. I'll rescind my motion. You would like to make a motion? I would like for, uh, to make a motion to put this on the debate agenda. Second. Okay. So I move to debate. Thanks, sir. Uh, Mr. Oh. Kennedy. The uh, next item is a statewide mutual aid and assistance agreement. Uh, these are really coming up for re renewal, so you'll see this one with uh, GEMA, and then there will be some more local ones. But the, uh, the key point to these agreements is that without them, we would not be reimbursed for any kind of mutual aid support that we were to give another county. So that's what makes it totally essential. Um, staff recommends approval for the four-year period ending March 1st, 2020. Four-year contract, huh? Four year, well, it's four-year agreement. Yeah. Agreement. Is this for all 159 counties, or we have to No, no, this, is, this is with GEMA, and then we, we go out and we do local ones as well. Move to consent. Because GEMA could ask us to provide mutual aid to a county that we don't have an agreement. Okay, but as long as we have this in that, place. This will okay. cover that. Second. All right, so moved. Uh, security cards. I'm sorry, before we move on, Andy, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? No, oh, Andy, I didn't see you back there. I'm sorry. <laughs> Andy. Guess not. We're good? We're good. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the next item is security cards for the new voting machines, which we don't really have yet. Um, which are however, new in yeah. 
And which we're getting weeks. training for as we speak. Yes. So uh, Nancy Gay is getting trained right now, and we are uh, supposed to have all the voting machines by 15 January. And how many voting machines are we getting? For us, it's over 400. And when the state provides those, they provide the the, the screen only. No. Right. Yes, the I'm screen, sorry. The printer. Printer. Um, the big counting device known as trash can. And other than these carts, what and, equipment do we have to provide? Well, there's there's accessories. a list of, of things that we're probably going to have. Uh, this being the, the most uh, expensive, I think, and possibly tables as well. So uh, we also had to renovate <clears throat> a, a warehouse for a new storage site because right now we still have all of our voting, our old voting machines, and really – until the state says they're ready to execute on the new voting machines, I could see us potentially having to store both, both the old and the new. And if that occurs, um, we're ready to do that. So uh, Chad and, and the special projects and facility maintenance folks have done an enormous job in getting warehouse uh, prepared for the new equipment. So. These carts, though, are an integral part of that. These carts will enable us to securely store and move the equipment uh, to and from precincts as we, as we, when we go out to support an election. And we're confident these security carts are compliant with the. We, we have that one that we're going to be we have getting. one now, and we've actually tested it. Okay, so, great. So the the security carts are fine, uh, but when this bid went out, no one bid on it. The only bid that we actually did get, and it was prior to that formal bid, was from Uline. And that's the quote that's given here, um, is the uh, $655 for a total of $33,087.06. That's with the $179 uh, discount off the catalog prices. They come fully assembled, or we have to have some no, we'll have to all assemble. together? So, uh, Shipping's free, Like though, an Ikea bonus. thing. It's pretty easy. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. Ikea's great. So... Um, we're, we're prepared to do that, too. So when the new ones come online, this is a sidebar question, when the new ones come online, what do we do with all the old ones? Well, they're supposed to pick them up. The, the state, state will pick the them up and dispose of them for us. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of discussion on that because uh, we've heard they'll pick them up before we get the old or the new ones, which kind of makes me nervous. Um, or when they drop off the new ones, they'll pick up the old ones. We're... For us, like I said, we're not. It's not going to be a showstopper because we will have the space to handle both of them. But not everyone can do that. So it's a lot of voting machines that have to be filled statewide by 15. Like I said, I'm. You know, I have confidence that the state will work through the holidays. Uh -huh. Or maybe they'll show up December 25th. And, <laughs> and it is our. It is. It has recently been brought to our attention the electrical. Requirements are not common, I guess. Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> you want me to talk Lack about a better word. Yeah. If you don't mind, please do. So, please. so the, uh, and, and that's really not new to us because we identified it, oh, I guess about a month and a half ago, Matt, we started talking about it. And, and the problem is that when you go to any of our voting precincts, oftentimes you can see 10 or more machines being voted, being used at the same time. Well, now you have you have a what I would best describe as a very large iPad screen. That's the actual interface device, and then you have a printer. So conceivably, you're going to have all of those being used at the same time. So that would be your max uh, amperage draw. And so what's happening, or wattage, and, and and so what's actually happening is with all those being used. What we figured was up to three machines. You could three full machines, screen the printer, uh, being used before you might trip a circuit breaker. So, you know, we can't go into all our precincts and say, "Let me see your uh, your what your amperage or what your uh, uh, circuit breakers look like," because uh, they're probably all going to be 15 or 20 amps for a particular room. Um, so what we're going to have to be prepared to do is react accordingly, and I think what that means is running extension cords and tapping off of different breakers. But we're, we're stuck with those machines. We're going to have to make them work. So 
So that would be a, another ancillary cost would be circuit breakers and power strips. You have plenty of budget to cover all these. Okay, we did. We did identify monies, and we knew that uh, that we were going to have to spend money to make this. Let me, let me just tag on to that. Uh, so yes. what I'm allowing them to do right now is I'm allowing them to overrun their budget uh, in certain line items uh, with the hopes that with other savings they may not actually go over budget. What we'll have to do is Ms. Reese and I will have to reconcile that at the end of the year, and this will be. Uh, I've identified money in our special project fund to be able to cover it, but we're not moving it at this time. It's kind of a management decision, but it, it, you know, th and this was not supposed to cost counties any money. I just That's sent a, I a picture of this to the Secretary of State. It's, it's, uh, this is a heavy. This is this is one of many. I mean, friend. this is going to be <laughs> when everything's said and done. You know, we could be three, four hundred thousand dollars into these new machines, and we are one of the lucky counties in our state that would have the ability to. Right. Cover. To handle right. that. Right. Very few. It's not just monetary. I mean, it's just it's the way we deploy them. It's the way we store them. Um, you know, our, our folks have been, as usual, we've been very much on top of this since the very beginning. Nice. We've got a plan in place for everything, you know, so we'll become the model, but not every county can is gonna be able to imagine. do it. I, I, I want to give just all, all credit where it's due to, to Glenn and the, the entire staff for your preemptive research, I think, has been enlightening to the state. Uh, in many ways, and as Doug just said, he just sent a picture to the secretary. I mean, it, I, I think that there are things that you guys identified that they didn't even consider. Right. I think the response, not to this one I just sent, but before was, hmm, we'll have to look into this. They'll, they'll say something like this, you know, you don't necessarily need these, but it's, it's all a matter of how you deploy the machines, how you secure the machines. You know, they, oh, you could get by without that. You're right. Then you'd have to lift each one of them each time. You know, the, the amount of man, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a precinct in these carts so we just deploy the carts into the precinct. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit of help on us, but, you know, if not, somebody's going to physically touch every piece. we way more well, efficient this way. And you're, what will happen is you'll end up breaking the equipment mm -hmm. because unlike the old equipment, which is all in transit cases. Yeah. Collapsed and. and right. Well protected. These are not. So the iPad. These are just loose computers, are in bags at yeah. most, so um, you can't stack them. So that's hence you can see why you need when you look at the cart, you see Elves. shelving in there. Um, well, this is a gift that keeps on giving. It is a gift that keeps on giving. Huh? Merry Christmas. Well, again, all credit to our staff for for being very proactive on that, Commissioner I mean, Richardson. I don't think you can't back out. Oh, you mean the you mean the precincts? You know that is that's a really good question and point because um, that's been that's an ongoing issue. There's a number of precincts that just say, you know, we really don't want you here anymore. Um, the schools are opposed to it for obvious reasons, and so that's a, that's a ever end, never ending challenge, and that could be a problem if we start tripping circuit breakers. You know, because your your only solution to that is reduce the number of machines. You reduce the number of machines, now you've reduced throughput, and that's how you start getting complaints of voter suppression uh, because you're standing in lines longer than an hour. It goes on and on and on. So, Question. It is. It, it will have impacts because that's a, you see those numbers fluctuate anyway. We have 47 precincts now. Um, and I know Nancy has had to look around for two places to actually hold the elections, polling places. But we don't usually have lines that are longer than an hour. I mean, given no, we have you, pre voting you machines, and you you would. If if you're tripping circuit breakers and you had to reduce the number of machines that you have available, things cause and effect. Right. Any further discussion? But we won't. Just we'll make it work. Make it work. And I have full confidence you will. Any any further questions or discussion on this? Do we have a motion? Yes. It says no. I said move to consent. Second. All right. There so you it's go. moved to consent. There we go. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, we did have an item added to the meeting, but that's down in executive session. No legal matters, sir. Uh, staff reports. Personnel savings. First item you have is just your personnel savings so far through uh, this year. As you can see, we've 
exceeded our budget goal. Um, the current number is $571,000 in, in savings. We're still trying to fill positions, but uh, we have a lot of positions to fill. Are we changing our tactics to attempt to fill these at all, or is it just a matter of so we, we've, we've had that? some discussion about how to how to do that. I mean, in the past, it's been just kind of throw the job out there and see you know what what happens. We're doing. Uh, I, I know for certain positions, we're, we're uh, doing a little more targeting, and and I, that's what everybody's doing. I mean, people are coming to us and they're stealing our best people. Right. So we've kind of started using the same tactic. You know, we're, we're going to individuals that may be interested in these jobs and we're trying to recruit them away from where they are. Um, and it's been, sometimes it's been successful, sometimes not. It's, it's a little heavier lift on, on the staff to do it that way, uh, but to get the right people, you know, that's what we'll have to do. All right, any questions regarding this report? Uh, internal services. Yes, I have three reports for your review. The first is the year-to-date budget report. This is the month ended November 30th. We should be operating around 42%, and all funds are operating well within their budget. What does IPTF stand for? Insurance Premium Tax Fund. Questions? None. Next report, ma'am. Next report is your favorite report, the sales tax report. <laughs> we have received funding for the month of October. That was not quite $2 million. And we are currently uh, showing an annualized percentage increase of 8.13%. Fantastic. Which goes back into the points we were making yesterday in that TIA meeting. And the final report is the investment report for your information. Any questions? From no questions. No questions. All right. Uh, any comments? Seeing none, we do have one item for executive session. What's your pleasure? Motion, we move it to the full board. Second. So moved to the full board. Anything else before this committee? We stand adjourned. Next, ma'am. What do you want to do? Yep. Let her change the little whatever's on the front. We'll keep moving.
microphone. I'm calling to order the um, December 10th meeting of the Development and Engineering Services Committee, having already um, uh, prayed and pledged. Uh, we have a quorum here. Um, but do we have a, um, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting from November? Move to approve. Second. Thank you. Um, do we have any changes to this agenda? Thank you. Um, we had a presentation, but I do not see that person present. Is Oliver Page here today? Being absent, we'll move on to uh, consent agenda, having nothing there. Debate agenda, new business. Mr. Schlockner, tell us what you've got. Thank you, ma'am. First one I have for you is bid for a uh, RV. I'm not going to say, I'm going to call it a. I'm going to say that is just uh, an attractive <laughs> title to this item. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any Fogel pictures site in at my... Wildwood Park. So basically, what we've done here is is currently <laughs> the <laughs> currently the uh, when the RVs the campers are pulling out, they use the um, septic tanks located near the bathhouses. We have a lot of problems with those getting over overfilled. We're constantly pumping them out. We're spending a lot of money. This will allow us to build a nice large um, septic system out in the woods, up close to the gatehouse. It'll be three lanes of access to the septic system. Uh, we did get a bid in of a lot lower than this. However, the, the bidder left some stuff out. Uh, we did some research. We were not comfortable with that low bidder. So the most responsive low bidder was Brooks Brothers Construction in the amount of $440,865, and staff has recommended approval. So when this is built, this will last for how long? A long time. A long time. Very long time. We'll have to maintenance, standard septic system maintenance, but hopefully we'll eliminate all the problems that they're having near the bathhouses. Yeah, that's a nasty thought, but I'm just trying to think about, uh, I mean, if you spend a half a million dollars, I hope that uh, this is something that'll last my lifetime. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it will. <laughs> it is. We actually went out and looked at points west. Move to consent. Second. So move next. Next I have for you is the forming arts change order number eight. And this is uh, consists of three different items. The first one is to provide a access control to doors in terms of the building. Basically, this separates front of house from back of house. Um, this will allow key card access to those areas. Um, we feel this is a better way of handling access versus passing out keys when different shows come in, different production companies come in. Uh, we can assign key cards to those companies. If they don't return our key card, we just deactivate it. If they don't return our key, we have to rekey doors. Um, this will allow us to keep record of who's going in and out as well. So this addition was recommended by staff. The county Correct. Correct. initiated Correct. this. So when I look at the backup, one of the items says, this price does not include any additional labor to install, but when I keep looking through there, Ace Electric has labor in it. Builders Hardware has labor in it. What additional labor could possibly be needed on top of those two subcontractors? Nichols, which is our security provider, has some money in here, but they are a separate contract. They do not fall under McKnight, so they'll be doing work. So McKnight is saying if for some reason Nichols does not do their part and we have to step in, you'll have to pay us for that. So you feel like that is a legitimate yeah. uh, We're, we're okay. confident Nichols will do what they have to do. And But Nichols contracts directly with the county? Correct. Next. Next part is a additional stormwater tie engine. Previously, you approved a change order for the parking deck that included some stormwater parts. This allows the tie into that so that all flows into one system. So this is a result of a change to the parking deck that goes through the uh, PAC site. 24 inch, big enough, everything's going to work together, and no additional days. Yes, ma'am. Ma Thank you. And the third one is to provide some HVAC duct revision near the stage curtain pocket. Um, there's some AC duct work that actually goes where the curtain rolls up into. The curtain rolls up above the stage when not in use. There's some conflicts there, and this will revise that, allow that to all function properly. What did the architect say about that? Did he? I have not talked to him personally, but. Yeah, is that. Can you approach up here and give us a super quick um, rundown of, of how this collision happened? Um, 
Well, this is work that's very critical to the project. These are acoustical curtains above the stage designed to tune the room for various different types of performances. They recede into pockets, and those pockets have to close so that they don't absorb sound anymore in the room. And so uh, these pockets for the acoustical drapes were not properly shown on the drawings. Uh, they were observed by our acoustician when he was here visiting the site a couple weeks back and required some modifications to get the work that was in place. Change it. Uh, our teams worked very closely with the contractor and the owner to um, arrive at the best solution. That. Do, that you feel, do you feel like this is a fair price for rerouting some duct work? Yes, we've looked at it. There's a number of things that were, um, were already installed that were in the way of it. And the dimension of the acoustical curve itself couldn't be adjusted to accommodate that. Police intrusive. Mr. Sautner, you feel confident with the, the number in the process? Staff has reviewed it. Um, I was not personally involved in the review, but staff has reviewed it. They felt comfortable with the numbers. Come on, come up here so we can hear you. I have my answers. Thank right. you. Consent. Second. So moved. Next. Next I have for you is a change order for Lakeside Park. Um, first one is to provide some drainage for underneath our playground to allow the water to, to flow off into our storm system versus uh, staying pocketed in the, um, the poured mulch system or running across the sidewalks. This is a change that staff has requested, amount of $10,162.49. Staff's recommend approval. Like what you did over in, on Fierce Ferry Road where you piped the water into the creek. Same type of thing. Not sure what you're. For the development on Fierce Ferry Road where all the medical offices outside of Westlake. So this is this is actually in the playground. Hmm. We have uh, water holes. You, you might have noticed it over here at Evans Township Park. We're going to put some drainage underneath that playground so that when that water falls in the playground, it drains underground away instead of okay. coming up in the playground. But these are the downspouts, correct? This is that's the, uh, next this one. Is the playground. The next one is the downspout. Okay. All right. And this cost is covered in the geo bond budget. That's correct. Move to consent. Second. So moved. This is the one for the uh, additional piping grading uh, to direct all the stormwater away from the pavilion structure, which is located in the park. This is going to tie the downspouts into our drainage structure so we're not dumping more water in top of our park. Staff's recommend approval of $8,638.70. Second. And why was this not thought of on the front end? Why are we just now missed it. coming up with it? Missed it? But we got it in the budget. We do have someone in the budget to cover it. Okay. All right, so move next. <coughs> next one I have for you is a ordinance uh, of mending Chapter 6, which is our Alcoholic Beverage License 2, Division 2, Section 6101. Uh, currently, that section of our ordinance states that drinks are to be served by employees. Um, that's all it states. Um, but it, also, it says inside the premises. Um, we want to go back and add that, it, that the drinks must be sold by an employee and that also it, it puts limits on the amount that has to be sold by the employee. So beer not sold to quantities of more than 60 ounces. Wine should only be sold by the ounce, glass, or carafe, or bottle. Filled spirits should only be sold by the drinks. Wait a minute. What does that do for a pitcher of margaritas? Well, it, later on in the... Ordinance. There's a happy hour. I believe it's happy hour. It <laughs> There's about, an exemption uh, for margaritas. It was well, uh, <laughs> technically, anything can be measured by ounces. Yeah. Don't <laughs> buy the drink. Yep. But but that's a, that's there, there not overlooked. A, there's right. a there's a part later on. I will verify. I'm pretty. I'll give you the actual code later. But later in the code, it talks about selling specials, and it does not limit it to how you can sell to the table. The, the big key here is is that we're changing from being served by the employee the drink. to being sold by the employee. Big difference. Mm -hmm. And there are no downsides. We've already talked about this once. But. We've been through it from top to bottom. There's a there's a big push now to change the way people are doing their, their drinks. 
they're allowing to be a, a controlled self-serve where you're actually buying access to drinks, but you're limited to how much you can have, all based on a computer program. With that new system, you can't do that in Columbia County. This will allow that new system to be sold in, or be used in Columbia County. Um, basically, it's all RFID controlled. You have to actually put your license into the system. Or your credit card goes in the system. You have to actually touch your RFID so it tracks exactly how much you've had. It knows that it cuts you off at a certain amount. Uh, pretty pretty neat new system, but huh. using Columbia County with our current code system. And I'm just thinking about the current people in current businesses with restaurants and stuff. This does not affect them. It does not. Move to debate. debate. Thank you. Second. <laughs> Move to debate. What you got next? Turn it over to Mr. Scarborough here. Let's talk about while alcohol we're, a little we're, bit more. Right, while we're on the topic, <laughs> while we're on the topic of alcohol, uh, first one we had is the committee is the alcohol. most fun committee. I just want to, mm -hmm. I just want you to know that. Uh, <clears throat> we have the alcohol beverage <laughs> license for Rare Hospitality International uh, Incorporated and doing business as Longhorn Steakhouse, uh, number 5621. A Longhorn Steakhouse has applied for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer, wine, and distilled spirits for on-premise consumption from the 434 Lewiston Road. The applicants has provided all the required information and posted the site as of November the 15th. Staff recommends approval of the license with the January 1, 2020 effective date. Move to consent. Second. So Longhorn is building a restaurant on Lewiston Road? <clears throat> right on the corner. Uh, across from the Kroger. Good. All right. The second item we have is I'll call beverage license for M -M or MBB Brothers LLC doing business at Gas Pro Whitesboro Road. Uh, Gas Pro um, Wrightsboro Road applied for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer and wine for off-premise consumption from 4311 Wrightsboro Road. They have provided all the required information posted and uh, posted a notice on the property as November 15th, and staff is recommending approval for uh, with the January 1, 2020 effective date. No comments from the neighbors? No comments from the neighbors. Move to consent. Second. So moved. All right, the next item I have is a reclassification, uh, reclassification and salary adjustment. Um, in code enforcement, about uh, not quite four years ago, our supervisor left the county. Uh, and as part of that, we tried to re rehire for that position, but no one qualified. So for the last, like I said, right quite at four, four years, we've been doing without a field supervisor in that position. Um, Jason Singletary is the person I would like to put in that position now, and that would be a changing his position from an inspector one grade 21 to a supervisor four grade 21. This is a budget impact for the final, the rest of this year of about $894. Uh, and next year it'd be about a $1,788 budget impact. And staff recommended approval of uh, the position of Jason Singletary from an inspector one to a supervisor four. Are you intended on replacing him in his current role if you promote him? Uh, no, sir. He, he, we have another position that's open that we need to fill, but uh, he, he, he will still will be in the field doing some of the, his work, but he would also be supervising those people, the other inspectors in the field. I'm just, from a business standpoint, thinking if you made it four years without one, do you need one? And is the volume of work there? It, it is, and he's, and he's actually been doing that work for the past probably about eight months and being able to keep up with the, the workload that he's had in the past. It's pr put a, a pretty good load on Dana uh, in, the, in the past because she's having to supervise everybody as well. So within the past eight months, we've seen a, a good impact of relieving some of the duties that uh, he's taken on, relieving them from her. So she's not having to do that. She go back to doing her managerial duties. So the opening that we have is not replacing him. We just have an, another opening. Correct. That's correct. Who would be consent? Second. So moved. Next. All right. And go back to alcohol license. We have an alcohol beverage license for local Augusta LLC doing business as local. Um, uh, the applicant has applied for an on, uh, for be alcohol beverage license to sell beer and wine from on-premise consumption at 3851 Evans to Locks Road. They have required provided all the required information and posted the site. They ask recommend recommending approval of the license for the January 1 of 2020 effective date. Would be consent. Second. <coughs> Moved. All right. And the last one we have here is an alcohol beverage license for Taiwan Sand Corporation uh, doing business as uh, Swazdi Restaurant. 
They have applied for an alcohol beverage license to sell beer and wine for my on-premise consumption of 3836 Washington Road, Suite 7. They have uh, provided all the required information and posted the site as of November 15th. And staff recommends approval with the January 1, 2020 effective date. Move to consent. Second. So <clears throat> Next. Scott. Uh, Yes, this is uh, this request is for a phone allowance to uh, the planning tech position. Currently, uh, our planning tech is uh, doing more and more planning related activities, work in the field, uh, and is um, also traveling out of town on occasion on behalf of the county, and is using her phone, her personal phone, for that communication back and forth amongst staff. Uh, so we are recommending that uh, the commission approve uh, phone allowance uh, for that position. Second. So moved. Any additional items in your report today? Uh, not, okay. not until later. Uh, do we have any legal matters? Thank you. Staff report, development services. All right. And the first report we have is the November 2018-2019 development services monthly report. Uh, and a copy of that report is attached for your review. Or if you have any questions, I'll be glad to address those. No questions. All right, the next one we have is a, the November 19, uh, 2019 Development Services Financial Report, and a copy of that is attached for your review. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to address those. Having no questions, moving on to the next. All right, the final one we have is the November 2019 Temporary Alcohol Beverage Permits, and a copy of that report is attached for your review. No questions. All right, planning services. All right, attached for your review is the uh, planning department workload measurement monthly report. Uh, requires no further action. I'll answer any questions you might have. Having no questions, move on to the uh, next report. October uh, report for plan review workload measurement monthly report. Again, no further actions required. Answer any questions you might have. No questions. Having no questions. Thank you for your reports, gentlemen. Uh, commissioners and public comment and participation. Do we have any public comment? Anything additional? Having none and no um, items for executive session. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. I'm kidding.
I'd like to call to order the December 10th Public Work Service Committee meeting. Having the invocation of the pledge, we'll move on down to one with three members. Minutes, I'd like to call. Second. So moved. I'm sorry. <laughs> this old, is good, yeah. Like so. That's my Christmas present. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. We appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, any major matters, Mr. Driver? <laughs> Clayton, you want to give us that F report you got? Uh, not much to it. No so, questions. Public comment item. So, turn. quick one. That would have been a record, actually. <laughs> Get on that. One. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Would you hand this to? <laughs> Nine fifty-three. We'll move right into Community Emergency Services Committee. Uh, we'll go right to uh, approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. Move to approve. Second. So moved. Uh, any additions or adjustments to the agenda, sir? Out of my knowledge, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any presentations? Nothing in consent. We'll go right to a debate agenda. New business. Uh, fire and emergency services. Your consideration, I have a renewal of our Motorola Mock Alert service contract. Uh, it's an annual renewal, budgeted, price actually went down this year. Um, and staff recommend approval of the renewal of the agreement and authorize the chairman to sign that for one year. Yep. Second. So moved. And the last item is a request to purchase uh, the IFSTA e library licenses for our personnel. We spend uh, several thousand dollars a year the latest uh, manuals for training firefighters, ongoing and new members. Um, this is more cost effective for us because um, while it's a lower price, it also gives us the entire library of, of training manuals. Um, while there are various ma um, publishers, uh, State Fire Academy recognizes the need to consider this also uh, within budget and we recommend approval. Move to consent. Second. That's so moved. Yeah. No items added. We have, Mr. Driver, we have any uh, legal items? Very good. Staff reports. Your information, I have our annual run report, last month's run report, and our budget report for your information. No questions. Do we have any other commissioner or public comments? I have one comment. Just yes, sir. 
congratulate Mr. Kennedy and Mr. Luton on the Christmas tree lighting. I mean, sometimes I'm blown away by just how many people are there and the good time they're having and how well it's run. And my only criticism would be that you let the county chairman change the time of the Christmas tree when it's going to rain, light that thing. But other than that, it was a perfect <laughs> event. So I did politics. Can we do this 20 minutes earlier? I, I would like to say, though, that that took a lot of people from all over the county. Mm -hmm. It took IT. It took, took uh, Matt, maintenance, was maintenance and Chad's folks, too, right? I mean, it's it's a massive undertaking. Mm -hmm. so Very much so. We're, uh, there were people, definitely representation across the board. So, and it takes everyone to get there. And my guess is a lot of folks take that for granted that you show up and it's just a, a great event, but I don't, and I appreciate it. It was fantastic. A lot, a lot of staff went into the whole weekend, Friday night, Saturday with the whatever, <laughs> uh, Sunday for the parade and all. It was just those guys out there getting it the whole weekend. And you could really see the benefits of the work that was done throughout <clears throat> since last Christmas, uh, the work that was done on getting the power out there uh, and the fiber so we didn't have that mess of electrical last year, real danger. And a lot of that work has paid off, and that'll pay off in the future. Thank you. One more thing I'd like to wish on a very, very happy Christmas and uh, let's just that thank you mr. Luden it's all very nice and people from all over the county were here uh, more than just the county right not just the county not just our county that's the fact <laughs> yes all right um, nothing for executive session uh, we'll adjourn at 9.57.